Christ is risen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. Yeah. Amen. That's our Jesus. That's our Messiah. That's our Savior. Glory to him. And that's why we're here this morning, to glorify him, honor him, and worship him. So please stand and let us sing together, Jesus Christ, this is for you. Only you are worthy, our Lord, our Savior, our forever King. In your name we pray, amen. morning. Happy Easter. It is so good to see so many of you here this morning as we celebrate the risen Lord. Amen. We especially want to welcome first-time visitors. If this is the first time you've joined us for worship, we invite you to make it to the welcome desk after this service. We have a gift for you. We would love to visit with you there. Please do that. We have an anniversary to celebrate this week. Jeffrey and Marla Fry have been married 36 years. And we do have a couple of announcements. Wynn Stanton, who um, passed away a while ago, his service has been postponed. And Ron Hamill passed away this week. 
we'll give you information when we have it about both of those services, so be on the lookout for that. Today is an exciting day. Stick around. After the second service, we're having an Easter egg hunt. We want all of you to come. Be here. Find your Easter eggs. So do that. Have some breakfast if you haven't already. Great thing. Also, after this, hopefully the second service, if you purchased a lily, please pick them up today and take those with you. And then I have two other quick announcements about April. Can you believe? Tomorrow's April. On Tuesday, April the 2nd, we're going to have a very important informational session about Alzheimer's. So if you or someone in your family or someone that you're close to is suffering from this, please come and get more information, information about resources available. That will be April 2nd, it's Tuesday, 6 p.m. in the Education Building. And then please put on your calendars, Thursday, April the 18th, LaDonna Gatlin will be here to tell her stories. And I will tell you, she's the little sister of Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin brothers. You can imagine what kind of stories she has to tell. And she will. Um, so we hope you'll join us for that. And now Barry's going to come and carry on. Let's say first of all, welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see everybody here on this beautiful day the Lord has blessed us with. Uh, the way we do our service today is a little out of the ordinary because I tell you, the choir has got such a great uh, program for us. I can't wait for you to hear uh, the gift that they're going to bring to us to glorify God with. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come down at this time. And normally we don't begin our service with an offering. But I'm going to ask them to come down let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, on this most holy and glorious day, we praise you and we give you thanks and honor for Jesus Christ, for what he has accomplished upon the cross, what he has done for us, and that he is alive and alive forevermore. And because he lives, we shall live as well. Father, with this hope that you've given to us, we are grateful. And now we return to you your tithes and our offerings, and we ask you to bless these for your kingdom. For in Christ we pray, amen. Amen. Would you please stand?
can fathom immeasurable love, a Savior walking steadfastly toward death? Who can fathom mercy so tender, a Savior bridging the divide between us and our estrangement from the Father? Who can fathom a gift so undeserved, so overwhelming, a doorway made out of that which was once death, Oh, see how the hour of Christ's glory comes. He has come to create a doorway from a cross. He will eclipse the sorrow of our fallen world. The Father has longed to reclaim us, and so the Son has chosen this path. Those who have been living with the mystery of the Incarnation now see His purpose. It has become painfully clear He will take our sin unto himself. Death itself will die. Hope will be reborn. It will take a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. It will take a lamb. For one brief moment in time, the empty tomb meant nothing more to Jesus' followers than a robbed grave. Their Messiah had died. They'd seen it. Mary had seen it. She, the woman out of whom Jesus cast seven demons, she who loved her Lord so fiercely, who never left his side, now stood at that empty tomb. Her Savior, her friend, was not there. She would never hear him say her name again. Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, had come, but they left just as quickly. Not Mary. Mary stood there, weeping. Dawn had not yet broken on the world. Dawn had not yet broken on her heart. But then she heard it, her name, her name. It was him, and he was saying her name. And suddenly, the empty tomb was so much more. Dawn had come, and Jesus was alive. This is how we know what love is. He came and laid down his life for us. Yeah. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the richness of his grace. There is something about the blood of Christ, isn't there? We can hope to understand it, but it's a mystery and unfathomable, as unexplainable as his coming. The punishment that we deserved was put on Christ. He put on flesh and chose to walk with us, to break bread with us, and to pour out his lifeblood. And just as the blood of the Lamb delivered the Israelites that night long ago in Egypt, so now Christ's own blood delivers us at the cross. steadfast love never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Would you pray with us, please? Lord, my soul will continually remember how you sorrowed and how you suffered. As you were pouring out your life on the cross, you cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now because of that, I get to cry out, Abba, Father. Because of your great sacrifice, 
we are plunged beneath the fountain of your redeeming blood and are forgiven. You've brought us to this new covenant. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray in your merciful and faithful name. Amen.
There are appointed times set by God to do business with man. And Jesus calls Passover my appointed time. The Messiah was set to bring us redemption at the appointed hour. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. It was the blood of God's only begotten Son that would serve as our atonement. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, Christ presented himself to John the Baptist. And when John saw him, he proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, behold Jesus, the Passover Lamb. He could have come in all his splendor, greater than the eye had ever seen. He could have come in robes of scarlet, and all the world would see that he is he. He could have ridden on a white horse as a warrior and conqueror.
If you have your Bibles, would you please take it to John chapter 20? We're going to read verse 1 and verse 11 through 18. It reads, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When my little girl Carrie was little, we took her to see Disney on Ice. And this was the one that had Snow White on there. And Carrie was a huge Snow White fan. But she's a very tender-hearted little girl. And so it came to the part where Snow White, spoiler warning, Snow White took a bite of the poison apple and he thought she had died, and so she's laying on the ice, and she's just laying still. And Carrie knew the story like the back of her hand, but look over, and my little girl is right next to me, and she's just crying and weeping. And she says, Dad, I wish he would hurry up, come along, and kiss her already. <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of felt like that this whole Lent season. We have been focusing so much on the cross, and rightfully so, because the cross is where we find salvation. The cross is where we see the power of God. The cross is where we see the ultimate demonstration of God's love. But it is so hard to see, so brutal, so horrific. And I could not wait for this day where we could come together and just say, he is risen, he is risen indeed. And we have this opportunity to, play, for, to proclaim this great message because without the resurrection, I'll tell you, nothing else in this life will make sense. If this life is all there is, if there is no resurrection, that means the cross is emptied of its power, that means that we are lost, that means that we are without hope. In fact, Paul put it this way, 1 Corinthians 15, and if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But he's alive. And that's the point that Paul makes, that he is alive forevermore, and his resurrection changes everything. It means that everything makes sense. In this world, I want to start this morning by telling you by, by telling you a story about a man in the church that I serve named Eddie Peterson. Eddie Peterson was not a church-going kind of man. He was a good old boy. Uh, he sold farm quick equipment, tractors. He had a big farmland, and and he was just a good, hard-working man. He thought men were made to work. And the church stuff and the Jesus stuff and all that, that was for women and children. He had no time for it. He had no need for it. So every Sunday, as his wife got dressed and would go to church, as his only son, who has grown to this time, would get dressed and then take his wife and his kids to church, Eddie would put on his overalls, and he'd go out to his farm, and he'd work the land. It wasn't that he was angry at anybody. He just didn't see the need for religion or the need for Jesus. The whole Jesus thing was just a waste of time. 
until one day his son, his only son, started having headaches. The headaches wouldn't go away. So at the age of 27, he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I'm sorry, Tommy, it looks like you have a form of aggressive brain cancer. And i got to be honest, survival rate is very minimal. When Tommy told his mom and when he told his dad, his dad did not know what to do with that. And he said that it couldn't end like this. It couldn't be like this. This is my son. Life cannot be over. This cannot be the end. And he was just flabbergasted. And he said, there's got to be more. And he struggled with it. About two weeks later was Easter Sunday. And as his wife and Tommy and all of them got ready to go to church, Eddie shocked them by getting dressed up, put on his cleanest pair of overalls, and said, I'm going with you all today. And when he went there to church, the passage that was read and preached upon was the one that we looked at this morning. And there was something about when Jesus said the name Mary. And Mary realized that Jesus was alive, that it clicked in Eddie's mind. And for the first time, he said, it makes sense. It makes sense. The resurrection, Jesus, it all makes sense. You see, the resurrection is not just a nice story of Jesus we put on the end of our Easter celebration. It's not the bow that we tie on to it. It gives meaning to everything. And what I want to do this morning is look at the story of Mary Magdalene. And I want to share with you three things that Easter does for us and how it impacts our life. And my prayer today is that it will change your life the way I know it's changed me and the way I know it's changed so many of us in this room. And the first thing I want you to see this is because of Easter... It means I can let go of my guilt and be made new. I can let go of my guilt and be made new. Now, I know that this church is filled with a bunch of good people, right? But my guess is you haven't always been good. (laughs) You've done your share of stuff. We've all made our share of mistakes, bad choices, sins. And I'm not here to beat you down about that. I'm here to say, what do you do with it? What do you do with that guilt? Because what we tend to do is we try to ignore it, we try to hide it, we try to deny it, we try to excuse it, but no matter what you do with it, it's still there. It's kind of like if you try to clean up your house by stuffing the trash in the closet, it may look clean for a little bit, but pretty soon the whole house is going to smell. Eventually that starts to come out. Well, Mary Mary Magdalene had a past. She came from a town called Magdala. wasn't known to be a good town, especially if you're if you're a woman came came from there. And Luke eight two tells us that it was Jesus who cast seven demons out of Mary. Seven, seven's a lot. And the number seven in the Jewish faith meant complete. So what this meant was that Mary was completely a mess. Her life was complete chaos. It was before she met Jesus, she was a wreck. And that's what she was known for. Her life was a complete chaotic mess. I had a chance one time to baptize this wonderful girl named Angie. And her life was a mess from the get-go. I wish you all could have met her. She was a character. But Angie, from the beginning, had three strikes against her. She was abused as a child in more ways than we can say. And that abuse led to her having substance abuse to try to cover up her pain. The substance abuse led to poor choices. Poor choices led to more abuse. More abuse led to more substance abuse. Substance abuse led to more bad choices. She ended up in jail. She ended up homeless. She chased everybody away. You looked at Angie, and you would say, that is a worthless piece of humanity. She was awful. She made choice after choice that was terrible and chased everybody away. 
And she knew that. And it was on... She ended up at her last stroll when she was in a crack house, laying on the floor, being kicked by her boyfriend, praying that he would kick her so hard it would kill her so that she would have to go through another day of this. But when they left her there and threw her out on the street, she had nowhere else to go. And someone said, there's a place called the Grace House. It was connected to the church I served. It was a ministry for women with addictions. And when Angie went there, she found something that she had never found before. She found someone who would see her for something more than just an addict. She saw, she was seen by someone other than just an addict, a victim, She was more than just a homeless woman, a a convict. They looked at her through the lens of grace, and for the first time she said, someone saw me as, as Angie. And she said, you don't know what that meant to me, where someone looked at me and saw me. Not for what I've done, not for where I've been, but they saw me. And when Mary met Jesus, he saw her more than just a demon-possessed woman. He saw her more than just someone who had all these sins in her life. He saw her as Mary. And he did more than just love her where she was. He made her better. He delivered her from all that. And she was new. She was Mary. And how powerful that was. But... Imagine how this felt for her. If Jesus is dead, then all of that died with him. He said she was forgiven. But how can she be forgiven if he is dead? He said she was made new, she was delivered. But how can she be made new and delivered if he is dead? If he is dead, then it is all a lie. So what do you do with your guilt? I'll tell you what you do. You do what Mary did. You look in the empty tomb. Look at verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white. Now this is very important. Two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Now that's important. So much that when when Mary looked into the tomb... She saw the first thing, it was empty, but there were two angels. Now, why is that important? In the Old Testament, we've heard about today, there was a sacrificial system that was made where you would have to atone for the sin. The high priest would make a sacrificial sacrifice, a lamb, and would take that blood, and he would place it on what is known as the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant, there was this thing called the mercy seat. And that's where the blood was applied. It was where you found forgiveness. It was where you found mercy. And on that mercy seat, God was very deliberate in how he said it had to be made. You had one angel at the head and one angel at the foot. Meaning that when Mary looked into the tomb, she just didn't find an empty tomb. She found the new mercy seat. She found a new place where we find forgiveness, where we find grace, where we find atonement. And this wasn't one that was done just every now and then. It means that this was done permanently, once and for all. The sacrifice has been made. It is finished. It is finished. Mary knew she was forgiven. She knew that she was cleansed, and she knew that she was made new. Could you imagine if we truly believe that? Romans 8, 1, in Christ there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Think about that. I got to do this Emmaus walk, and I just love Emmaus walks, and I got to do it, and there was a woman from Alabama, and it seems like a lot of my stories come from people from Alabama. I don't know why that is, but she came there and she gave her story and y'all she was a hoot she got up there and she said now listen when i was younger i was a honky-tonk girl and she would go from bar to bar and guy to guy and she was having the time of her life and every honky-tonk but one day she went to a honky-tonk and she met this guy on saturday night and man they lit up the town 
They went out from one honky-tonk to another, to one place to another. And then the guy says, hey, I got an idea. It's Easter morning. Why don't we go to a sunrise service? And she said, I can't go to a sunrise service. I'm not dressed for church. Besides, my breath doesn't even smell right. And he said, no, come on. It'll be fun. We'll sit in the back. And she said she went into that church, sat in the back row, and when the preacher began to tell the story of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, she said that something just, she said, she said something sobered her up. <laughs> and she said that when he gave that invitation, she could not help but come forward and give her life to Christ. And she says, I'm telling you that, and this is what I love about it, she says, because I want you to know, on that day, something began in my life. I was not perfect. I did not make a perfect life. I made plenty of mistakes, but I stopped my honky-tonking. <laughs> and then she said, I ended up going to school. I became a nurse. And then she said, now I teach other nurses. And she said, I'm standing here today because on Easter morning, I met this man named Jesus. And it's never been the same since. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So that's the first thing. Second thing, real, real, real quick. Easter tells me that God sees me even when I can't see him. Look at verse 13. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, I've always been confused by this. I'm like, why, why didn't she recognize him? Why didn't she just say Jesus? Well, it was dark. She did just see two angels. And the last time she saw Jesus, he was beaten, bloodied, and dead. But I love how all this conversation goes. Even though Jesus is dead, she still refers to him as my Lord. But notice when Jesus says, woman, why are you crying? There's so much compassion there. And even though at this point, Mary can't see Jesus, Jesus sees Mary. And he sees her grief. He sees her pain. He sees all that she is going through. And then he says, Mary. I love that. Mary. The King of kings and Lord of lords knows not only your pain, he knows your name. And he cares. He knows your pain. And finally, Easter tells us that there's hope that things will get better. Look at verse 17. Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Think about this. The good news. He says, don't hold on to me. And that, that sounds bad, but he's saying, no, don't cling to me you got work to do we got a message to go tell the world go mary tell my disciples and notice the relationship here he says my god and your god my father your father and then you hear her testimony i have seen the lord i have seen the lord the one who was dead is now alive i have seen the lord think about the difference that makes Sin wears your victory. Death wears your sting. You see, here's the hope we have. Death does not have the final say. The very first funeral I ever did as a pastor was for a woman in our community. She was a Korean woman, uh, didn't go to church because she didn't speak English, but her son would occasionally come to church. And when he came to church and asked if we would do that, we said, sure, it's my first time doing a funeral. And then the grandson was there. And y'all, this is not a way to start off your funeral. When we had the casket and I was doing the benediction and they were fixing the clothes of the casket, the little nine-year-old boy screamed, 
mom, grandma, no, no, no. And they had to hold him back as he's trying to get to the casket. And, he, and I'm like, what do I do? And afterwards, he came up to me and said, will I ever see my grandma again? And I had to think about that. And I thought about what Jesus said to Martha. Your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection of the life. If anyone believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And if he lives, he will never die. Do you believe this? And I looked at the little boy and said, because Jesus lives, your grandma will live again. And he said, do you promise? I said, with every ounce I have, Jesus is alive. So what does this mean? Well, I'll tell you, Angie, when, she, when we baptized her, she had one of the greatest things. She said, when God got a hold of me, it was like he had to break me up hard. And said, he just cracked me up. But she said, for the first time in my life that I can ever remember, I have experienced joy. And I know that I am not Angie the addict. I am Angie, clothed in Christ, redeemed by his blood, made new. I got to do Eddie Peterson's funeral. And his son was there, the one who they said they, he wasn't going to make it. This was about 20 years afterwards. And after I told the story about Eddie, his son came up to me and said, Pastor, I want to tell you how that story ends. He said on Easter morning afterwards, Eddie went home, put on his dirty overalls, went to the garden, started working on the fence line. Tommy went out there to help his dad, but his dad was just standing there, and dad turned around and had tears in his eyes. He said, Dad, are you okay? He said, Son, what do you think it was like when Mary heard Jesus say her name, and she knew that it was going to be okay? He said, Well, Dad, I don't know. I guess it must have been pretty good. And he said, Son... I heard God say my name today. And it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay. So are you consumed by guilt? There is mercy and grace. Are you hurting? He knows your name. Do you need hope? He is alive and alive forevermore. And how do I know this? I know this because God sent his son. And they called him Jesus. And he came to love, heal, and forgive. Now I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And as we get ready for a closing song, I want us to sing this together. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. Praise God, he lives. What does all this mean, this redemption, this new freedom in Christ? Christ became like us in order to break the old covenant of death, allowing himself to be crucified, our judgment laid on him. Suddenly the shameful cross is something different. It's been changed. Now it's a bridge to hope. Christ's resurrection ushered in the new covenant. 
There was something never seen before. Because of his great love, we are no longer slaves to sin. He has thrown open the gates of the kingdom. Now because he is risen, we live. Hallelujah. Easter to everyone. He is alive. He is alive forevermore. As we leave here today, remind everybody, we, we have our wonderful pancake breakfast outside. So if you would like to help uh, support our mission to Kenya, we'd love to have you come be a part of that. Also, we have a photo booth for you to take your Easter photos. I know everybody's dressed in their nice clothes. So come take your photos. Also, after the second service, we are having our Easter egg hunt. And so we'd love you to bring your kids. Now, if uh, you're, we're, there's no age limit on this Easter egg hunt. And I have good authority that they are Snickers and Reese's peanut butter cups in them. 
Well, y'all, what a joyful day. He is alive. He is alive indeed. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, as we go forth this place, may we go forward knowing that you are the victorious Savior, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are alive and alive forevermore. May we leave here with that message to share to this world. For in Christ's holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Go in peace.